One of the most iconic Greek heroes, Bellerophon, is nonetheless a victim of confusion spread by later sources, as well as modern fiction. Most often in relation to his most famous companion, his winged steed, Pegasus. What is the true story of Bellerophon and Pegasus and what might they represent? Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and consider supporting me through Patreon. Big thanks to all my Patreon supporters. The story of Bellerophontes, or Bellerophon, and Pegasus belongs to the most archaic strata of Greek tales. It is recounted in brief in the Iliad by Glaucus, his grandson, and later by Hesiod, who includes important details about his horse. In origin, the tale is likely local to the area of Corinth, and continues the narrative begun with Sisyphus, a king of Ephes, which some believe to have been the original name for Corinth. He was a mortal trickster and rival of Zeus, and he was also the grandfather of Bellerophontes. He was the only mortal to marry one of the Pleiades sisters, the daughters of Atlas, nymphs of the stars of the Pleiades linked to navigation, one of whom is a mother of Hermes. One of his children was Glaucus, who has his own interesting and difficult relationship with horses. According to Hesiod, Glaucus had won the love of Euronome, a woman who was greatly favored by the goddess Athena, a woman who knew every art and was said to be as wise as the gods, perhaps a fitting match for the son of Sisyphus, the most clever of men. Yet Zeus, disfavoring the son of Sisyphus, had vowed he would never produce a child born of one father. That was when Poseidon intervened, acting as the godfather of the child of Glaucus, and making Bellerophontes the son of a god and the grandson of a nymph. The original name of Bellerophontes was said to be Hipponaus, meaning horse mind. And some say he acquired the name Bellerophontes from having killed his brother by accident, with the name understood as Belleros and Fontes, meaning killer of Belleros, or killer by throwing missiles. Others say he killed a former king of Corinth called Belleros, otherwise unheard of. Whatever the case, it is thought that he traveled to see the king of Tyrans, Proetus, in order to be absolved of the killing. That is when the real trouble began. Bellerophon was said to be extremely endowed by the gods in both his strength, skill, and physique. He was a very handsome young man, and he caught the eye of Anthea, otherwise called Stenevoea. She sought a romance with the young hero, but when he rejected her advances, she was angered. She went back to her husband, filling him with lies of how Bellerophon had tried to rape her. Proetus had given Bellerophon his hospitality, shared meals with him, and taken him under his roof. Murdering him now would be a violation of the rules of hospitality and an affront to Zeus. So he came up with another plan. He wrote a cryptic message to his father-in-law, King Iobates, who resided along the river Xanthos in Lycia. He then asked the young man to deliver it for him. Bellerophon was only too happy to act as messenger for Proetus, little suspecting that the message he carried was one that called for him to be killed. But as the fates decreed, after Bellerophon made the long journey to Lycia, Iobates did not even inquire about why the young man had come before offering him hospitality for nine days, during which time he feasted and held joyful company with the man. When he finally got around to reading the letter, he was furious. Yet he was in the same bind as Proetus now. He could not simply kill the lad without incurring the wrath of Zeus. He had to devise another plan. That both of these incidents bring up the significance of offering hospitality and the divine protection such status affords may directly relate to the myths of Bellerophon's own grandfather, Sisyphus whose murderous treatment of guests brought about the wrath of Zeus. Being aware of the fate of Sisyphus, 
They are wise not to make the same mistake, yet they try to find ways around the rules to arrive at the same end. Iobates decides to give Bellerophon an impossible task that will result in his death, the slaying of the beast Chimera. It was a monster with the head of a lion, the middle of a goat, and the end of a serpent. Most said it was the child of Typhon and Echidna, with siblings such as the Lernian Hydra and Cerberus, the Hound of Hades. Its breath was fire, and it laid waste to the countryside. Bellerophon was downcast when he realized the immense difficulty of this mission. He wandered about thinking how he might possibly accomplish his task. As the gods willed, he met Polyedos along his way, a famous seer of Corinth. He knew that Bellerophon was in need of aid from the gods, and a very particular horse. He advised the young hero to seek out the goddess Athena at her temple. Bellerophon went, and according to Pindar, he prayed fervently to the goddess, offering sacrifices and then sleeping upon her very altar that night. While he slept, the goddess came to him in a dream, and she told him that he must seek out a horse, Pegasus, with the aid of his divine father Poseidon, after making a sacrifice of a white bull, and to slip on the horse the magic halter that she gave him. In the morning, finding the golden halter beside him, he ran to seek out Polyedos, who explained that he would need to return to Corinth, for there, at the well of Pirini, he would find the horse he sought. This is where our most famous horse enters, Pegasus. He was another child of Poseidon, born from the gods' unblessed union with Medusa, a priestess of Athena sworn to chastity, but who is said to have constantly bragged of her beauty and who violated her oath to the goddess in the confines of her own temple. When the hero Perseus cut off her head, Chrysor, the one with the golden sword, and his twin Pegasus leapt from her neck. Yet if we look closer at this origin story of Pegasus, there are some odd parallels between the horse and Bellerophon, whose original name was Horsemine. Both mothers have stories that link them to Athena. Both are said to be sons of Poseidon. Glaucus is cursed by Zeus not to have children. Medusa is sworn to chastity. More suspicious yet is that little is ever heard of Chrysor after this birth. He was thought to be human in appearance, for a statue of him does exist, but he has no associated myth. A genealogy provided for him by a later source calls him the grandson of Sisyphus, and in all likelihood, in the original tale, Bellerophon is Chrysor, the twin brother of Pegasus. Finding the great winged steed at the celebrated spring of Corinth, he follows the instructions of Athena, bridles the horse, and mounts it for the first time with great excitement. Hesiod tells us that when it came time for Bellerophon to travel, he was given Pegasus by his father, and upon his back he rode through the skies, flying unwarily everywhere over the earth, for like the gales he would course along. There is some debate about the meaning of the name Pegasus, with some linking it to a name for a proposed Hittite lightning god, while others find this etymology unlikely. I propose that the name relates to page, meaning to trap, fasten, and relates to the bridling of the horse in connection to the iconic magic bridle gifted by Athena that allows the horse to be ridden, and that in turn this likely relates to a myth of the very first person to ever ride a horse. The most important site of Pegasus is the spring in Corinth, the Pirini, and that means of the Osiris a tree that is often used to make bindings of various types. In any event, Pegasus and Bellerophon do seem linked to storms and floods in the most archaic level of this story. Pegasus goes on to carry lightning bolts for Zeus, and wherever his hoof stomps down, springs are created, and the feats of the two heroes potentially echo those of Poseidon or a storm god. 
Consider that they are both sons of Poseidon, who is not only a god of the sea, but of violent storms, floods, earthquakes, and of course horses. In Mycenaean times, he likely had a larger and potentially different scope to his activities than survive in the Homeric period. Some of those earlier traits may well be expressed by his most famous heroic son. Now powered with the aid of Pegasus, Bellerophon went to slay the Chimera, flying across the Aegean upon the back of the horse. Yet of this epic battle there are varying accounts. Some say he rained arrows down upon the beast to kill it, but most artistic depictions show that he fought with a spear or a javelin. Perhaps most famous among these stories was the monster was impervious to all of Bellerophon's attacks and even on the back of Pegasus, they were feeling the heat from the breath of the monster and could hardly continue much longer. Then Bellerophon had an idea. He put lead upon the end of his spear and lodged it in the mouth of the beast. When it tried to breathe fire, the lead melted and killed it. Much speculation surrounds the nature of this chimera, with some linking it to a Bronze Age Eastern sun goddess. The name Chimera means she-goat in Greek and ultimately from Proto-Indo-European meaning winter. The word was used as a counter for the age of livestock, especially goats. So you would call one winter old, two winters old, etc. This perhaps supports an interpretation that the beast represents the year and in turn the slaying of the old year. Its triple nature is also suggested to have an astrological significance. Yet these differing views can perhaps all be connected. A sun goddess would seem to be connected with the yearly cycle as well as with fire. Added to this is that Poseidon was normally given a month in his honor during the winter around the time of winter solstice. He thus presides over the time of the shifting from the old year to the new year and this may relate to Poseidon's role as the god who presides over the low regions of the sun when it spends most time beneath the waves. It likely also relates to it being the wettest time of the year in Greece, and this is probably the primary reason for the association. And it's this connection with wetness that seems key here. Regardless of the possible link to the representation of the year, the chimera's breath is fire and it burns everything and is thus related possibly to drought. Some have speculated that the myth might even originate from a strange natural occurrence in the region. On the mountain now named Mount Chimera burns an eternal fire fed by gases from beneath the earth and lit perhaps in some ancient time by lightning. They were a feature known since our earliest sources and the light from them was even used in navigation. Could it be that extinguishing the fires of the Chimera corresponds to extinguishing the fire upon this mountain? Is the story about feeding lead into the throat of the creature representative of someone trying to fill the gas holes with lead? It's possible that this natural feature at least plays some part in the myth. But as he is the son of Poseidon, it would seem that he is the hero to put out such fires because of an ancient association with storms, rains, and waters. Triumphant over the fire-breathing dragon, Iobates refuses to believe Bellerophon's account of his victory, sending him instead to fight the local Solomoi tribes and the Amazonians, whom he defeats by dropping boulders on them in some accounts a feat similar to that performed by Poseidon in the Giganomachy. These specific tales would seem to relate to a myth about the foundation of the Greek colony in Lycia, how they defeated the local population of non-Greeks and thwarted forces of chaotic nature represented often by the Amazonians. Yet even after all these victories, Iobates was set against him. In a final desperate attempt, he sends Bellerophon into an ambush Yet the young hero defeats everyone sent against him. The personal guards of Iobates then rush out of the palace to attack him, but Bellerophon calls on the aid of his father Poseidon, who floods the plain behind him. 
as the hero strides towards the palace in a war fury, the flood following his footsteps, a final defense is made. Women are sent running out of the palace, lifting up their dresses, stripping themselves, and offering themselves up to the young hero. Curiously, this act drives both the warrior and the flood away. Though strange, the story is not alone. This very same act is described in Irish myth when the famous warrior Cúchulainn is in his war fury. When presented by naked women, he must avert his eyes and retreat. Yet it seems less to do with a concern for modesty than it relates to some very ancient idea of averting a destructive force with nudity. In this particular episode, it is also apparent that Bellerophon is acting as a type of avatar for Poseidon. Afterwards, Iobates gives up explaining everything to Bellerophon and has him marry his daughter Philone, the younger sister of Antia. The hero obtains half of Iobates' estate and goes on to have several children. A few of his grandsons fight in the Trojan War. Bellerophon traveled back to Corinth to confront Antia. Some say he killed her in revenge for her lies, but most think she committed suicide as murdering her would have been an act too low for heroic Bellerophon. Yet Bellerophon grew restless. He had obtained great worldly success, defeated great beasts, had produced wondrous children. He had achieved all the success that one can within the world, and he was not content. Ever he rode Pegasus through the skies, but his eye glanced upwards to Olympus. Finally, one day, he decided to make the journey. After all, hadn't he defeated the Chimera? Hadn't he opposed all odds? Didn't he deserve to reach Olympus? On the back of Pegasus, he could do what no other man could. He could ascend to the height of Olympus, the abode of the gods. He set off higher and higher, but why Zeus learned of this attempt and was not pleased. To thwart the mighty warrior, he sent but a single fly against him. Pegasus, startled by the fly, began to buck and threw his rider. Due to Bellerophon's mighty strength, he survived the fall from the skies, but he was never the same again. Cursed by the gods, he wandered through the wilds far from the paths of men, consuming his own soul until he died alone. The obvious reading to this story is about hubris. Bellerophon thought he deserved to go to Olympus due to his mighty earthly deeds, and judging how Heracles got there, you know, he wouldn't even be wrong, right? But Zeus determines who enters, and Zeus was never very fond of Bellerophon. Yet Zeus does let Pegasus enter, and moreover he takes him in as his own steed, and so there may well be another element at work here besides hubris. It may relate to a struggle between different tribal gods and heroes in an archaic past. All of Bellerophon's ancestors are important ancestors to the people of the region of Corinth, yet are made out to be rivals of Zeus and depicted fairly unflatteringly. Bellerophon was the only one to rise above, yet he is smacked down by Zeus in the end. It seems unlikely to me that the people of ancient Corinth would formulate tales of their own ancestors, casting them in such a negative light. And it might be that some of the tales we hear in sources like the Iliad are tales from the perspective of particular groups of Greeks who are not entirely favorable to others from different regions. Yet because of the great popularity of these poets, the accounts in the Iliad and Odyssey become the true accounts and other local variations fade away. Yet we might also look at this from the perspective of the myth of the first horse rider. A fairly common accident is being thrown from the horse, but the fall can be dangerous, even deadly. Many have died from falls from horses, and many more have been seriously injured, including receiving head injuries. That Bellerophon is said to be cursed afterwards 
wandering about in misery seems like the description of one who suffered a brain injury from falling from a horse. The gifts of the gods are one's own abilities, especially cognitive abilities. People with brain injuries were thought to be cursed and were sometimes driven out from their communities and forced to wander the wilds. I suppose this is where I remind everyone to wear helmets when riding horses or bicycles. My own father suffered such an injury biking just down the street when someone backed out of their driveway and hit him. So don't take any chances you don't need to. That is also a form of hubris. As Bellerophon may have originally been the twin of Pegasus, it is possible that like with other divine unions, he was the mortal twin and Pegasus the immortal twin. And that it may be this which sees Bellerophon fall and Pegasus ascend. But in some ways Bellerophon can also be seen as an example of the quest for overcoming the world and ascending to the gods. The flying horse is a common motif for the visionary seer. Bellerophon overcomes the dragon, representing the worldly illusion of forms, and thinks this will elevate him to the heavens, but his physical form and his ego is not able to obtain Olympus. The winged steed representing his spirit can, but the body cannot, the ego cannot. He can only catch a glimpse of it before falling back to earth. Yet Pegasus now resides in Olympus, charging forth through the skies in the thunderstorm, like the swift gales traveling over the earth as Zeus casts his lightning. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please remember to like, subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon. And as always, stand tall.